Thank you very much. Wow, that's a very like uh, aggressive recording notice. Hang on. Okay, uh, so welcome everybody. And uh, let me just introduce you to our esteemed speakers for today. So first up, we've got um, Shar Mina, or Shah for short, who's the Product Manager of Notifications at Seek. And then after that, we have um, Casey, Head of Product at Settle. Could the two of you give a very quick intro about yourselves, please? So Shar, give it a go first. Hey everyone, hi. Uh, my name is Shamila, you can call me Shar. And I'm currently in Seek, which owns um, Job Street and Jobs TV, and I'm taking care of the notifications product. So I've been in product for about three years, and before this, I came from a marketing background. And yeah, that's pretty much my short introduction. On to Casey, who has some fans in the chat, apparently. Yeah, I suspect many of them are from the Settle team, actually. So, um, hi, I'm Casey. So, uh, I, I. Uh, run the product team at Settle. So essentially, um, our focus is very much on uh, like how do we build to delight motorists, um, turning mundane, uh, very boring uh, grudge purchases like a uh, few into moments of joy. Lah. So that's kind of the passion and focus of my team. Um, and yeah, it's nice to be here tonight. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Okay, we're going to uh, stop sharing screen so that we can spotlight the two of you. Nice and big. Wait up. Uh. Jing, jing, jing. And then one for KC. Ta-da. All right. So, um, Let's get started with the meat of the product questions. So we're here today to talk about how you measure product success, whether it's at Seek, Settle, or even with some of the previous products you've worked on. Could you talk to us about how you measure product or future success and what are the criteria that you both use? So um, either of you can start first. Casey, maybe for that? Oh, no, no, ladies first, always. Thank you, so honorable. Very nice of you, Casey. Um... So yes, um, product success, how do we measure this? Um, so every time we look at the success of the product, I think for, especially in Seek, we always start with what we call outcomes. Um, what is our product trying to achieve? What is it? What is the user problem that we're trying to solve? Um, we ask ourselves, what is the outcome that we want uh, we want to aim for? As well as if there's a problem that you're trying to solve, what will stop me from solving the problem? Or how do I know that I've solved it? So when you start looking at the outcomes, you can start going for trying to look at all the different metrics that will kind, kind of look at this particular metrics will actually give me the best indicator of whether I've achieved my outcome that I set up for. In notifications, generally, um, we look at the user journey. Um, so what I mean by that is we look at you, how a person moves from A to B outside of the website or the site or the app and how they enter the, um, our platforms and what they, what they do or what they, how they navigate across the funnels. And um, just to give you a bit of an introduction, for example, one of the products that we launched was a job recommendations. Um, and what we did was the outcome that we were trying to achieve is we wanted to help someone who was looking for a job to find something when they're not on the platform. And so the outcome or the main success metric ended up saying, um, person A is looking for a job, can we send them an email or a notifications that gets them to apply for a job? So the success metrics for that particular product eventually became, did they receive the message? Were they happy with the jobs that they got? And then finally, did they actually apply? So that's essentially how um, we look. I look at um, product and how I look at success metrics in um, Seek. Casey, okay, over to you. Sorry, uh, all already. Uh, what was the question again, Akim? <laughs> okay, it was um, how you measure product feature success and what criteria you use. Uh, I would say that's fairly nuanced. Uh, in the end of the day, it's a balance between the business and business value and customer value. Uh, do we deliver what uh, the business needs and the customers actually value it enough to use it? Uh, so I mean, uh, that, that can be measured in either quantifiable ways or um, uh, unquantifiable ways, uh, like qualitative ways. Uh. So, I mean, uh, it really depends on the, the aspect. Like, uh, I mean, if you break it, break down a business from the very top, 
to the various aspects of it. Uh, I guess uh, metrics can be established lah, to track uh, the success of everything. But even in the end of the day, it's kind of a balance between both lah, the, the data, the, like the measurable uh, quantitative aspects and also the qualitative. Lah. It's a very high level answer to a high level question. So I hope that, that suffices, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, it's a good way to uh, just kind of look at it from a bird's eye view right now. So uh, speaking of value, how would the two of you measure that intangible value? So for instance, like um, developer productivity uh, when you are working on those tasks or also for employee engagement? Le Long, yeah. who wants this? <laughs> Casey. Yeah, I can go. First uh, I mean, the, the, the very, very, very core, I mean, how, of how ah. I think we would weigh a product manager's level uh, is how well can they uh, empower an engineering team? Uh? Are they working in harmony? Is the engineering team empowered? Are they happy? Uh, are they uh, ready to voice ideas? Um, is everyone aligned, moving in the same direction, clear of the, the job separation and all of that? Uh? Uh, between product design, uh, engineering, QA, and all of that, uh, that, that is a prime measure. Uh. So, okay, that one, uh, numbers cannot measure one. Uh. You kind of can tell uh, whether it's right or wrong. It's wrong when fingers are pointed here and there. It's right when everyone is aligned, uh, running in the same direction. Uh. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that is the developer side of it, which is, uh, I think, uh, very, very fundamental. Uh. Yeah. Is okay. that something that the both of you measure quantitatively or is it something like more of a gut feeling that you, you get walking around the office? Because it's, I mean, it's hard to tell right now, COVID, you don't even see people. How do you know whether they are engaged? So in SIG, they have sort of, we've put in a structure. What, what, so there's three types of metrics that we measure and we report to on a quarterly basis. The first one is the product metrics, which is how well your product is performing. The second one is a very developer metric, which we call the platform help. Um, it's decided by the team of developers. They tell their managers that this is the metrics that we need to show that our platform is working. So that looks at number of incidences, processing rate, um, change failure rate. We also look at time to restore, um, uptime and deployment. In the case of notifications, um, generally the platform health is as long as we can deliver the notification that we want to, and if the system goes down, how long do we take before we deliver it? So the time to restore and the number of incidences become sort of like a spread metrics for the platform. The third one was um, very interestingly something that was used to kind of understand our emotional feelings. We call them the team health metrics. It's done across the business, but it's done on a team level. So every quarter, all the teams have a very short survey, five questions um, from a scale of one to five how um, balanced do you think your workload is? Do you trust your team members? Do you understand what the goal is of your team? Um, do you feel that you're collaborating well with the other stakeholders? Um, are, you giving the are you given the autonomy to make decisions? Do you feel that the velocity you're going at is right? And um, the last one is, do you feel recognized for the, work, for the work that you're doing? So this team health metrics, we measure on a quarterly basis. And what we do is, um, we, once every quarter we get the results. So we can compare ourselves against our previous, quarter, our previous quarters in terms of team itself, but we can also compare our team against the rest of the team. And if there's any shared or like common things that are going down, for example, if like during the, um, during the COVID time, almost everyone sort of like kind of shared that they didn't feel, they didn't feel like the velocity was as good as they wanted to. So then as a management, they addressed it. But in the case of my particular team, we noticed that um, we couldn't collaborate because people were like trying to navigate timelines, time zones. Then as a team, we started trying to stop. So that's, that's sort of like how we do it in sleep. Is that uh, something that's relatively new or just um, introduced recently? I'm just asking this to kind of gauge like how different that experience was after you implemented these intangible metrics versus before. We introduced it about a year and a half ago. Before this, we were trying it with smaller teams and just getting feedback. Um, and then once most of the product owners felt like it was actually quite useful. Um, and the most important thing is it only works if um, the employers, uh, sorry, the employees feel 
that they can be honest about the results. So then we tested it a few rounds and then we got feedback. Eventually it kind of became like, yeah, people were like willing to like voice out negativity, they were willing to be honest. Um, and then we made it part of like a structure for every quarter. Okay, that's good to know. Oh, sorry, Lisa, are you going to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious for both, you know, uh, in both your cases, how you visualize the, the KPIs, you know, do you put them on the screen? Do you talk about them in your stand-ups or do you like present them to a committee, you know, like in a typical corporate structure? I mean, I, 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 I do that a lot of the time actually because of the company I'm from, but I, I imagine that there are better <laughs> ways to visualize and to motivate people with, with, with these metrics. So how, how do you, uh, yeah, how do you visualize them and, and get people behind them? Um, okay, so structured, yes, there is a structure. We follow OKRs in SEEK, in Job Street. Um, so how it works is every, every financial year, the executive team will lay out um, five main executive goals um, in terms of priority. And the teams will then choose which of the priorities that they think they should be working on. Some, obviously, some priorities are just made, that you only can work on one and two priorities. You can't seem to work on five. Um, and then you make your objectives and stuff. Um, that's a structured way. Every quarter, we present our um, OKRs against the executive goals and how we think we're adding up. Um, internally with the team, how we try to do this is um, every stand-up, we, I, I, I take turns, I try to get my developers to run the stand-ups and every time we have a stand-up um, or even the planning session, we always start with the OKRs. What's the objective for this quarter? And then we kind of like map on like, are we there, there? Or do we think we can achieve it? Do we think that we need to reassess it? Um, mm -hmm. And then when you start giving the developers, they kind of get through it. Oh, cool. cool. What about you, Casey? Yeah. Um, so from a settled side, we started with the OKR set, I think uh, Q3 2019. Okay. Uh, from Q3 2019 onwards until today. Lah. Uh, so it's something we actually revise on a quarterly basis. Uh, and in fact, in the early days, uh, we monitor it on a weekly basis. Uh, now I guess we have reached a scale where um, individual teams would run and monitor their own uh, respective uh, key metric to move. And the, the interesting thing to note uh, uh, is when everyone is allowed uh, it, it's very transparent. Like everyone can move together. Like I'll give you an example. Um, when we first started with, uh, with Settle, um, you actually have to link your Mishra card, your physical Mishra card, before you can earn points. <laughs> Prior to that, you can't earn points, so sorry. Um, so we actually, uh, the, the beauty of an OKR is uh, for, for an engineering and product team, um, only, only the team. Okay, only the team can uniquely impact it. Uh, so, so our team, uh, we have a lot, we had a loyalty team back then. Um, but it's actually, how can you make to have a mature card? 100%. So, so the, the goal was to execute building blocks towards that. Uh, it might be easier than it sounds, but uh, trust me, it's not. Uh, I mean, uh, you could just give everyone a virtual mature card, whack any. Uh, I just wait and give, but hey, what happened when the person has a physical cut? What will you do? How can you handle that operationally? Um, like the call center, everything, how you handle those edge cases. Um, and, and that's the piece where the team collectively, like, I mean, between the like, program managers, even engineers will chip in, hey, what, what about this? Let's try this. Designers will chip in, let's try this. And as a team, they would have a plan. Uh, that and everyone has assumptions to move the needle together uh, so i mean that that's where i mean we, we got validation of that working uh, as we scale uh, yeah so i mean uh, that makes sense to the team it also makes sense to the business uh, so from the business lens it's like okay these guys are moving the right needle uh, and collectively that moves our business goals uh, Neat. Okay. 
uh, no other follow-up questions to that already. So it's not even like an interrogator like from the Spanish Inquisition all of a sudden. <laughs> all right. So uh, moving back to product metrics as a whole as well, what happens um, for your teams after you measure the metrics? So like uh, any actionable items that you have based on the, the results that are gathered? Shai can go. I'm mute already. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she mute myself. No, yes. um, I think I was just trying to think what's the first thing we do. I guess we communicate. It, it's sort of like the, the having the metrics is one thing, but the product manager role essentially becomes like communicate it up, communicate it across, up, down, everywhere. Just make sure everyone knows what the hell you're doing and what your help the team is trying to achieve. Um, even if it's good or bad, just try communicating it. Um, but we we also kind of like have like we try to put structures we try to but it's not obviously all the time but what we do is um every every month or every week every every two weeks we look at the metrics all together and we say which are areas that we think we're doing well like we want to it's good good news good news is good news uh, which are the areas that are problematic areas um say for example a particular metrics went down um, and then we go, we work with our teams to find out whether is this worth an investigation? Is this worth stopping the product releases? Is it worth um, like um, getting an entire, is it worth even um, looking into it as well? So usually the ones who sort of like look into that um, before we get our developers involved is the product, product heads, the UXs and the team leads, um, the engineering leads. Um, we have a mini group and then we just say, hey, do we think we want developer engine developing developers' resources in this? Or do we think this is something that we just it's organic and we just need to communicate it? So, um, so and then from the section items, we'll we will kind of like ask guidance from the management like what's the next step or what should we do next. Okay, good to know. Casey, what's your take on that? What happens after the metrics? happens after the metrics that's i mean uh, a few oh, important the, things the metrics, to note uh. the metric in the end <laughs> yeah 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 i mean uh i guess uh, even in terms of metrics kind we set it already we run it uh, we will learn whether it's the right metric la. sometimes we learn that teams can game the metrics then it's like wrong metric la. have to change uh, it has to move the business needles uh, in the end of the day, of course, uh, I mean, like Lisa mentioned, uh, we have a lot of metrics that we actually present and show to the board, the key business performance numbers and all of that. Uh, so, so what is, I guess, important is um, for, for the team members, uh, imagine up to, a, let's say I'm a team member in the team, I'm a QA, I'm a team member in the team, I'm a designer, I can actually see which are the metrics I move uh, amongst them, the, like, the many, many business metrics. Where, where is my direct contribution in regard to the business goal and, and the high level business vision? Uh, yeah. So I, I guess, uh, uh, okay. Having said that, another thing also we learned, I mean, I've it, uh, as we scale, uh, we have to rely more on the data team uh, to provide the real bulletproof metrics. Uh. Uh, our analytic metric all those don't I mean it gives a gut feel it's not uh precise la. Hmm. so maybe actually to make it more uh relatable for our audience also uh, can can either of you think of a story where you actually looked at a metric and you had an oh crap we are so screwed moment you know and you made a you made a pretty big change to the product by looking at a certain set of metrics, you know, just maybe just so we can uh, bring that example to, to life. You looked at the metrics, this wasn't working and you actually made a feature change or something changed in the product. Can you think of a, a compelling story like that? Um, that's, that's happened before. Um, yeah, there was once there was a really, um, it, it's a funny story now, but it was a really scary story back then. It was, the first few months of joining um, Job Street, and we were trying to release a new algorithm that powers our um, job recommendations. And the metrics that we, we were chasing was um, conversion to applications. 
So we want to try to get as many people in the final to try and apply for a job. Um, and the good news is when we released the product, the numbers went up really high. Um, and we were like, okay, you know, like it's good news, right? Like positive. And about a month and a half in, into it, we noticed that some other numbers, um, I can't really share but for PNC, but like some of the numbers um, within the other parts of the business started falling because of, and, and, the, and uh, the data analytics team basically came back and said, I think it's something that you guys did because none of the other teams have done anything. It's definitely you guys. And you're like, no, like we did really well. Like you don't look like you're like achieving. <laughs> Turns out that we forgot one of the biggest number one business rule that was impacting the revenue itself. And we changed the business rules without getting our CEO's approval. Um, and he flipped out naturally. Um, but it was all good. I mean, like basically he just wanted to find out like how did you like guys not figure this out when you were releasing the product and we just had to say, hey, you know, like we were trying to chase this vanity metrics and we didn't realize that there were a bunch of business rules that had been there. Uh, mm -hmm. And what happened is we had to go back, roll back. We had to... Con we had to go back and tell the sad news that our good news is no longer good. We actually didn't supersede anything. Um, we did well, but we didn't supersede as much as we had celebrated. Um, but I think the most important part about metrics is being able to tell the story, like being very transparent about what happened, what's the story, how did you get there? And at the same time, with metrics, it's always been like, what are you going to do? So we had to say, what are we going to do? Obviously, the success was not as high as we wanted, but can we do something else in the future? So that was a story that we had to go and tell. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. I, I always wonder with um, these products that have these uh, distributed uh, feature teams that work pretty much autonomously, how, you know, how, how they are able to collaborate and not affect or cannibalize in a way each other's business or sales or revenue figures. So that's a, that's a really interesting Interesting story. Ah, Casey, what about you? Any horror story? Yeah? That time of the week. Horror story. Yeah. Horror story that can share. I don't think there is much. La. Let me share the, the good stories. <laughs> la, huh? so, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Horror story, that one hide under the carpet. La. So, uh, I mean, what came to mind uh, when you asked, uh, I guess, uh, one very basic thing, la, like uh, in our efforts to get everyone I mean, going back to the loyalty story, I guess, uh, in our efforts to get everyone a menstrual card, we forgot that actually um, uh, we need to make people figure out how to use the points. <laughs> so we have a lot of people that just earn points that I don't know how to use. La. I mean, uh, I'm not sure about you folks, but uh, in the past, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And this, uh, yeah, that's why I have to download Settle. La, yo. So anyway, uh, what, what we learned uh, is uh, as we observe the the metrics to move la. and we uh, learned that okay we have a plan to move this already what's the next metric after that so we already gave people a card now they are earning points what's next uh, to drive further conversion we need them to then uh, start redeeming the points la. so it's potentially not as straightforward as let's say uh, like other market solutions uh, because we are tied to an existing uh, I mean an existing loyalty solution so what we learn is we actually have to drive activation of the card la which is another step. So, I mean, you need to key in some details like your ID details to do that. La. And users don't know. They don't know. La. So, I mean, we, we try different measures, put it in this screen, put it in that screen um, and and see the conversion. La. Yeah. And the numbers did move. La. I mean, as the team experimented, it was an open, I guess it was an open canvas la, for the designers, from managers all to, to figure out. La. Yeah. And come, come and tell, like align with the business team and all. Hey, this the plan. This is what we're gonna try. Um, uh, what's your feedback and all? Uh, and get that steer and feedback all along the way, la. Okay, good to know. Um, actually, speaking of that, to does corporate social responsibility in any way weigh in on your products value metrics for both? And if so, how does it do that? So, uh, Shai, you can go again first if you like. Um, no, not really, to be very honest. Corporate social responsibility, yes, we do have a team that's looking into this, but from a product point of view, um, no, I don't particularly look into that as much. Yeah. 
Not for notification. Yeah, I think this one, since Casey is with Settle, we can get some juicy... Yeah, la, absolutely, Kim. I was joking with Kim the other day. I mean, this is what we are here for. La. Like, uh, you settle, um, minimize contact. In view of these COVID times, there is no better choice, uh, uh, folks. So, so I mean, uh, uh, Kim has a referral coach. Uh, <laughs> go and check it out. But okay, la, I mean, on a more serious note, uh, we actually have something... Uh, very major la, something very major we are launching yeah so stay tuned to that la. it'll be very major uh, and it's uh, working together with the patronus group la, to do something to to for the rug yeah now now in these covid times uh i mean a lot of people are impacted um uh, with their jobs and whatnot so i think uh, all these are important la. Okay, I think that's the self-promo quota for the day, but thank you, Casey. <laughs> um, for, for the next question, uh, we'd like to, to ask the both of you as well, um, who in the team or the company decides what to measure and what not to measure? Um, okay, I'm going to sound very, very political or diplomatic, but wow, it's actually... <laughs> It's actually your users who decides. And at the end of the day, like product management, as a product manager, you're advocating your customers, you're advocating your users. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to build something to solve some need of theirs or some problems of them. So the metrics that you decide essentially is um, decided by how your customers behave, how your users behave. Um, and that's the most challenging part because you're trying to figure out what they're doing. And you're trying, to you're trying to measure against what you're helping them do. And user behavior, like any, anyone who's working on user journeys would know that no one, be, one user is the same, right? There are so many different segments, there's so many different types of people. Sometimes someone will be doing a particular way and then a few months later, market trend changes and they do something else. So your metrics will change. Um, how you advocate the metrics or how you get the endorsement that this is the right metrics is on is on us to communicate so uh, like a very good example is like uh, for notifications usually the number one common metrics is always open rate and click rates whether someone opens it and then someone clicks on it but over the last few years we noticed that people actually what they do is they see a notifications on the notification panel and then they forget about it and then they get reminded about it a few hours later um, so user behavior is changing. They're not going to click on it immediately or they might click on it. They might not do the action that you want to. They come back a few days later and they come and they do it. Um, so your metrics is when you start observing your users, when you start saying that, hey, actually they're changing their behavior, they're not doing this anymore. That's when you try and get endorsement from your bosses or your team saying that, hey, users are doing this now. We should be actually measuring this. We should be like, we should forget this metrics and start following what they're doing. Um, it sounds very cliche, um, but I mean, if you follow like Teresa Torres or Mati Kagan, they always say this and it's quite the challenge, but it's quite fun. How about you, Casey? Um, I believe, uh, I mean, let's say for us to put a metric to a particular team, it has to be a metric that makes sense to that team uh, and that particular team can uniquely impact. Like the team can't impact it, you let that the metric, no use. Uh, in the end of the day, the top line business metric is a, is a carefully considered and aligned uh, thing. Uh, I would say, um, let's say setting KPIs and metrics, that is something that um, like, like, the, the, like the oil coals are very, very good at. Uh, so, so cascading that across the team uh, in the right way to make sure that uh, people are empowered, uh, they, like, they, are, they would own a metric. Uh, and they can impact it is key. Another thing we consciously do uh, is we actually prioritize within the metrics. Uh, uh, everything we actually, um, I mean, the past we have tried before, uh, like, oh, measure everything. Uh, this, this, that, that, measure everything. Okay, that's fine. In the end, uh, there'll be one metric that is the top priority to move. Uh, and, and in fact, we, that is the, in summary, that is the num only metric we want to know the progress on. Uh, the rest, the team can observe and all, but uh, we try to 
push for that prioritization and alignment that, okay, I mean, it, and when the priority is clear, uh, what we also learn is the team can self decide. Uh. I'll give you an example. Let's say priority one, two, three is clear. Between the team members, uh, they would even question the PM that, hey, why you prioritize something from priority three, uh, not priority one. Uh. So, and then they would self correct and make the right call. Uh. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like the the way to go about it, lah. Like no matter what you hear, like uh, prioritizing for roadmaps and even for metrics or so, it's all about priority in the end for PMs day in day out. Um. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. What is Why, that number one priority metric for both of your products? If you had to choose the top three, what what are what are the most important metrics to you? Today, lah. I'm not talking about last year or you know, right now. Um. For notifications, it's all about um, the, um, loyalty. So that's basically how many traffic we get from existing users. Do we increase the share of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Casey, loyalty points. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, would say, I would say that is a very nice try, uh, Lisa. Um, <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I won't uh, share with you directly what is the, the metric we measure. <laughs> However, I would say we, um, I personally believe, I don't believe in vanity metrics. To me, things like app open don't mean much. Uh, however, it is all about the moment of value we offer. Uh, so so uh, we believe in enduring value and uh, enduring the, the real metrics. Uh, yeah, but I won't disclose. The amount of money yeah. people put into their settle wallet. <laughs> that, maybe, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe not. <laughs> we won't find out in this call, that's for sure. Okay, um, actually, when we're talking about that also, since we mentioned the main products, uh, sorry, the main product metrics you want to aim for, uh, how do you decide when it's time to sunset a product or a feature? Like, uh, do you have any kill metrics or thresholds like that? Mm. Yeah, because, you know, in the Agile community, we always talk about failing fast and this, but to be, to be honest, I have a lot of experience with stakeholders who have trouble letting go. It's very difficult to admit failure to a product. So it's, it's good to know if there are objective metrics that can tell a story and uh, make people feel comfortable to say that, okay, we got to kill that feature. It's not working. Sure. Yeah. So it's based on the outcome of the product. So essentially every, so every product you, that um, we create is trying to achieve a particular outcome, whether it's a business outcome or whether it's the um, user candidate um, outcome and to kill the product is you is basically you evaluate whether is the product still achieving what it's supposed to do is it still achieving the um, the objective so a very good example is um, a few months ago we had to kill one of our products which is on Facebook Messenger because Facebook itself had changed the entire way that Messenger works and because of the policy change that they had done the product that we were having no longer served this purpose. So then we made the call saying that, hey, you know, like we created this product to serve this need. It can't be done because of what has happened. Uh, we got to kill this product and we need to find another way to meet the, the outcome that we were trying to solve in the first place. Mm. Um, so that's for products. Threshold metrics, usually we use it for releases. Um, before, when we decide to release any new features, um, we have what we call check-ins and phases. And every phase, we would put a target of what do we think is a good indicator to say that this relief should continue scaling out or at what point of time should we stop and reevaluate and what time we should just go back. So um, threshold metrics really depends on what your features trying to achieve. So if your features trying to do something um, and you know that failure means this metrics, then you just put a threshold on like, if this metrics is touched, that means um, you need to slow back on your release or you need to go back and evaluate whether this product needs to be released, this feature needs to be released or not. Wow, actually, really cool answer. I also a bit like stunned for a moment. 
<laughs> That's a good thing. How about you, Casey? Like anything that you sunsetted um, and any metrics and data that you use to decide that? Yeah, I, I, I must say that from a product standpoint, we, uh, I mean, the what fail fast, all those kind of thing, uh, ah. uh, as, as pro managers, we, we are channeling one of the biggest business investments Okay, which is engineering time. La. And that is not something to be taken lightly, just whack and fail fast. No such thing. La. I mean, I'm a big believer of think big, start small. Um, if you want to, uh, it, like in terms of the execution, it cannot be like, a, um, give an example. La. Let's say we are doing an MVP. The intent is a true throwaway test. That one we have to go in eyes open. La. Like even the stakeholders need to be aligned and all. Then only we go. La. Else we should be going uh, with with like uh, with small uh, puzzle pieces, building blocks towards the larger goal. Uh, so um, having said that, there will be circumstances where certain, uh, let's say certain products or certain things don't perform. Uh, and when it doesn't perform and the data is, uh, I mean, and, and let's say across the business is abundantly clear, it's not performing. There will be a point where essentially um, you have to put a stop to it. Uh, putting a stop to it doesn't mean you just kill it outright. Uh, there are a few ways. One, uh, one way is you stop building on it. Uh, just don't build it anymore. <laughs> Leave it there for the small fraction of users that use it. Just keep it there. That's fine. Uh, and all of that and like gradually push it aside. Uh, that's one way. The other way is to go for the drastic cut. Uh, uh, which could be some partnerships and all of that. Uh, yeah. But all of that, uh, the, this kind of decisions are, are carefully considered decisions. These are not uh, like a single person's decision. Like, uh, I mean, it has to be very data informed, aligned. Uh, all the constructs are in place. All the business teams are clear. Then we 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 run together uh, to, to kill it, sunset it, let it. Uh, Casey, you unmute, you muted yourself for a bit there. Oh, sorry, I, 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 I ended Too my sentence. Really. Huh? Oh, no, no, no. okay, okay, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, too samanga until you to mute yourself. Um, okay. All right. Uh, just a fun little personal question from our team. Are there any metrics that you use to measure your own success? Like, you can support your back for a while. <laughs> Do I get to eat lunch on time? Valid, very if, I get valid. To, if I get to eat lunch, that's, that's a success for, for me. Casey? <laughs> yeah, personally, I have a KPI this quarter, which is to sleep early. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Yeah. How is the progress? <laughs> Managing. Uh, progressing, progressing. Okay, good to know. Some oh, things you need to, you need to evaluate only at the end of the quarter. Sorry, Lisa? I don't, know, I, I don't know whether that sounds incredibly profound or, or incredibly sadistic uh, <laughs> depiction of what your life, your working lives must be like if I get to eat lunch on time, if I get to sleep early. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Everyone, yeah, everyone, everyone in the team, <laughs> the speakers in product, the, the 70 plus participants are also mostly in product. <laughs> we, all, we all know, we all understand this, okay? <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to share some questions from the attendees uh, who, who uh, shared this at the point of sign-up. So um, how do the two of you feel uh, and measure the success of a release if it's just a minor release that actually doesn't drive revenue? In this case, is it worth measuring it? Do you apply the, the same principles for prioritization? Um, if it's a very minor release that doesn't drive revenue or um, a business outcome, mm. I, would, I would look at it as whether it's a task, whether it's just a task that needs to be done um, and treat it like that. So for example, like if it's a security release that has to be released, but it doesn't impact the users or the business, huh. um, it's, it's a task, like get the task done, highlight that this task needs to be done, um, okay. and then just define it by what's the definition of done. So essentially like, okay, this is ticked off, then that's it. Yeah. It's Okay, <laughs> everybody gets like, okay, job to be done, Gautim, Gautim. How about you, Casey? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, 
don't don't believe that you have to measure everything all of that don't waste time please very basic prioritize prioritize yeah man i heard that in my exhale of products voice um okay so next uh what are your thoughts on dark patterns in product which can help with increasing conversions and revenue but often at the expense of losing customer trust and giving a bad ux how um, do you as product leaders and also your ui or ux teams decide between both to me it's very straightforward uh. the what we do with dark pattern all those uh, is we don't even give the business team choice, uh. we just don't do it that's it uh. We we are always on the. Sorry. Because if you give a choice, uh, if you give a choice to the business teams, they will, they will ask for it, lah. Oh, the numbers will move, all of that. But uh, in oh. the end of the day, uh, the, the justification is, uh, we we make our decisions on the enduring customer value and enduring customer delight, lah. That's why we'll anchor our decisions on, uh, Yeah. Good to know. Sure. Um, well, I know dark patterns are like coming up, but it's it's very hard to avoid them, especially when you're trying to advocate for both the business and the users, because oh, business wants money, customers want free everything. Um, so the guiding principle is um number one is don't forget as a product manager you are also a user. Would is that would you use the product if that's what's going to happen? Always try to think of yourself. Ask a few other people. If they were actual users, would they use it? How would they feel about it? Ask your colleagues, ask bounce off. Um, it's always good to have the UX team away from the business metrics. So they play the devil's advocate on making sure that as product managers, we are keeping a balanced view on that all the time. Um, and it's be ready to be challenged. When, when you are showing your product out and people challenge you, that's when you start thinking about different aspects. And, and when you have a team that's always challenging you on asking what, how are you helping the customer, you try to avoid them as much as you can. Good stuff. Okay, here's a pretty interesting question as well. How do you test um, product success with a limited number of users? For instance, like uh, when Settle first started or for when you've just uh, made a new release, Shah, how was that like? adoption rate or like um, number of users who are using it more? Um, we tested using a lot of interviews, customer interviews. So we like, as product managers, what we try to do is we try to speak to as many customers, users, do mock-ups when we meet them. Um, um, we even try to create a mock-up of a prototype and test it against our employees, our friends. So the more customers, the more real life people you speak to, um, you can get feedback and tests, but just take it as a pinch of salt. Don't, don't take it as like that's the actual feedback that the, the market is going to give you. Um, but use that feedback as part of your um, check-ins. So maybe when you reach 10%, percent you be like, okay, I got a few feedback. Do 10% of the people testing it have the same feedback that I got from my friends? Okay, kind of like uh, their own little measuring threshold for that too. Yeah. yeah, how about you, Casey? I mean, like, um, can also share like Settle's early days or other stuff you've worked on. Hey, I mean, when you first release a feature, the, uh, the first test is whether, whether, <laughs> whether it goes wrong. So, so to back, um, and all of that, so so we can unfortunately fail fast and fail smaller. We do a progressive release, la, canary release. Um, uh, and in that context, we are really just looking whether the customer ops team shout at us. La. <laughs> oh, the chat increased. All, all those, la, I mean, that, that's the beginning. After that, of course, we see whether the thing is adopted, la, the feature is adopted. Is it used? Are people uh, like, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a very candid way of looking at it. Thank you, Casey. Um, I know, Casey, you mentioned earlier about, about having that, uh, 
that set of like data analytics and also having some analysts on the team. Um, what's your opinion on having a dedicated analyst for the product team or should the uh, product owner or product manager themselves also have a basic skill set for this? Both of you are actually. I can go first, uh, but I mean, uh, I personally suck at numbers on, uh, I'll be very honest. So, so I'm not, <laughs> that's not my forte. Um, uh, uh, it, it really depends on the size of the company. La. For, for let's say smaller scale and all that, then it's, uh, make sh it makes sense people wear multiple hats to get the job done. Uh, but as we scale, uh, specialization allows us to scale. Uh, so I mean, like I mentioned, the, if the numbers, uh, uh, to have precise numbers, you need people to look at it, la, to own the job and make sure the numbers are precise. Uh, like, like, I mean, getting it wrong to the board and whatnot is just impossibly crazy. La. So, so don't, that's not an option uh, yeah, as, as we scale. Um, in, okay, one thing that I'm very, very grateful or appreciative is that we have our own dedicated data analyst. Um, I think it's important that a product manager should know how to read and understand data. But what that helps me as a product manager is I get to spend my time trying to understand my users, what am I trying to solve for them, prioritization, so on and so forth. While the reporting or any anomalies are, are mostly done on the dedicated analysis side. Um, so what how how we break down the task is um, like I don't have to spend time looking for data. If I need something or if I need to like find out something, I just need to start thinking about the questions and like try and analyze the data while my data analyst will like try and figure out how to get this data, how to find this out. The other thing that it really helps is because like I think um, Lisa mentioned before, right? A lot of us work in products where like our like it's extended arms. Like one thing can cause another team to break. But when you have a data analyst who's like just focused on it and when they sit together, they kind of understand how the different parts of the business moves. And I find that it's a lot easier for us to identify that this team caused that team's KPI to break, for instance, because the analyst is looking into that. If you ask the product managers, they're just going to be like super stretched out and they're not going to realize that the other parts of the business are moving because of you as well. That's uh, definitely a mood. I felt that in my soul. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you both for your answers. We've got another good question from uh, George Wong. How do you make sure your North Star metric is the right metric to rally behind? Yeah, sorry, I have to turn off my video. Uh. Must, be my, must be my daughter watching Baby Shark downstairs. Uh. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> The North Star metric, uh, I mean, I mean, just, just for, for those that want to Google it, is the single metric that will move the business. Lah. And it's meant to be, uh, I mean, very self-explanatory to the extent where anyone in the business can know or make sense of that particular figure. Lah. Uh, so, so, I mean, for businesses to adopt that, um, it's a carefully considered uh, metric that is an aligned decision by the leadership team, lah, I would say, the business leadership team. Lah. To, to kind of make very clear, this is the number when it moves, the whole business moves together. Uh, and it's a very, uh, it's, it's a call that we cannot take lightly. Uh, you get it wrong, um, then we move the wrong collective number. Lah. Yeah. So yes, it's a leadership, uh, aligned, discussed, deliberated, and considered decision. Uh, yeah. Uh, I agree with KC. I think it's it's a very it's a leadership decided one. It's part of the storytelling on inspiring everyone to go for that one direction. Um, it's usually used for inspiration. It's usually used to um, steer out a lot of um, excitement and vision. But um, as much as the North Star metric is very important to get all the teams working, um, it's very crucial to understand that North Star metric is fallible. It's not it's not foolproof. Um, and usually, like in the case of like how we treat it in SEEK is that um, the North Star metrics are always challenged continuously. It's always discussed. Um, and like product managers who feel like that's not right or like they have a reason to say that they're concerned about whether we're measuring the right one, we raise it up. We just speak up and we say, hey, um, I don't think this is going to work because this is this. Um, but you, you trade it off. At the end of the day, it's a trade-off game, right? That you can't achieve everything under the sun. So 
the executive team will still decide this is the biggest trade off we're going to make and this is the metrics that we're still going to follow and then and then we just hope for the best for that thank you we've got one more from sofa which is uh wow quite um technical in a sense for non-e-commerce products like products that are built for productivity which are more operational um how can we translate success metrics like uh, the number of active users or product stickiness in order to justify and uh, communicate business growth or higher operating margin i guess the storytelling of it like right, for the metrics Uh, so notifications is one of those very interesting products that doesn't directly <laughs> impact um, the revenue margin all the time. Um, so usually, like, so there's a framework that I use all the time for notifications itself. I use the HART framework. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, just Google it. It's by Google. It's by Google themselves. Um, <laughs> it's a really awesome simplified way of like seeing metrics so h stands for um happiness like are your users happy p starts for engagement a starts for adoption r starts for retention and um, t starts for um tasks so you can use the hard one um the other exercise is um is regardless of whether you are hitting the margin or not at the end of the day is everything that you're doing as a team to meet the customer needs is also either bringing in revenue or saving costs. So if you're not bringing in revenue, see whether you're saving the cost. So, and how can you help the business save costs in that sense? Um, or if it's just loyalty, then you can just try and say that, hey, you know, like we're bringing back users and, and they're all happy and our MPS score is so happy. So really use the hard frame. I, would, I, I, like, I like using that. It's a lot simpler for me. Nice. Casey, any thoughts on that? I mean, in the end of the day, uh, any products main goal is to either non-profit or make money, lah. Uh, so, so I mean, uh, we we just have to be very pragmatic and practical. Uh, it's not about vanity metrics. In the end of the day, it's about the bottom line, lah. Because if we can't make money and all of that, or pay the bills, keep the lights on, sorry to say, like won't last, lah. So, so yeah. Okay. That got a bit somber very quickly. <laughs> All right. Uh, another one from yeah, Sorry, Angie. that escalated wrongly, but yeah. <laughs> it didn't, but it's just like when you when suddenly like everyone can hear the pin drop, it's just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that kind of moment. Okay, so the next one. Um, how, how do you gather ideas for new features uh, for a product? Like uh, in general, this is a question from attendees, not necessarily just metrics. Do you get like um, them from the product team or feedback from customers? Um, <laughs> this is something I'm learning right now, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah. And there is a framework that is built by um, Teresa Torres, who is um, fantastic. If you, you have to listen to her speak, um, she's one of the leading product managers and she has built this idea of continuous discovery where you help to figure out opportunities that you should invest in. Um, the whole idea is trying to align yourself on what you're trying to achieve as a, pro uh, as a product team and then getting your UXers, your developers and your um, tech leads to come in just like 15, 20 minutes every day or like every week to sit back and like try and see, okay, um, if this is your help, um, what are the, all, all the million ideas that you have? Brain write it. Just keep writing it. Don't vet it. Don't do anything. Just brain write it. And then map it together on um, which of this opportunity actually as a size, which one of it do we want to test it out in the market? Which one do we want to experiment on? Um, and that's sort of like a brain dump of an exercise, a structured way of brain dumping. And then after that, you use that to kind of like sense which opportunities you want to try and pick. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's quite, um, it's quite structured if you want to try and like, um, find opportunities or ideas and get everyone involved. Interesting. And Casey, how about your team? I tried turning on my video, see whether it survives. Uh. Um, no baby shot. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe turn off already. Uh. Hopefully, I'm going to So anyway, um, 
how do you gather ideas? Uh, depends on the stage of the company life, la, I guess. Uh, early days, very, very, very important in the end of the day is the customer. La. Early customers, what are they complaining of? What is failing uh, and all of that? Your biggest source are the ones closest to the customers, the ones that get scolded. La. I guess for me to see, it will be the support team. For me to be, it will be similar. As, for me to be, it might be more of the sales team, I guess. Um, so, so. Uh, that that fire hose is usually a fire hose, la, relentless. It's a wave that keeps coming nonstop. Uh, every day you get asked for it. Um, so so uh, the the challenge is discerning the signal versus noise, la. Uh, so for example, there are some things that um, can start off as a joke. <laughs> it looks like a joke, but after that, it's like how oh, serious, la. Like wow, okay. So, so, so uh, one good example I can share with all of you that is uh, not sensitive because it's there already is, uh, I'm not sure if you, for those of you that have used Settle, you'll notice when you fill, there is actually an option to fill in liters. Okay, I mean, you can normally buy fill in amount, 20 bucks, whatnot, but there is another option to fill in liters. Uh, and what we learned as we scale is is a lot of customers' requests for that feature. It started off as a joke. Then we saw like, okay, five requests a week, 20 a week, 50 a week, 100 a week. Oh my gosh, then it become a, not a joke anymore. La. It went into the backlog uh, right away. Uh, so, so another thing we also learned in terms of features is there's, there's usually no, uh, like, uh, I mean, if it's aligned to the, the job, the job to be done that we are serving, Okay, it's, it's within the realms of that job to be done. Uh, every feature is, uh, is, will need to be done eventually. Uh, it's it's uh, just that it might not be now, lah. it might be later. Lah. Yeah, so it's usually a fire hose. Uh, and as we scale, uh, like more and more teams, uh, we have different people owning different things. Uh, so we know that, ah, this one, you, you, this team, uh, that team, uh, check this out, check this out. So, so I mean, we like, whether the feedback comes from uh, the ops team, it comes from reviews, comes from Facebook, we get scrolled. Uh, I mean, then the, the teams actually see the customer's voice and will align to solve it. Uh, so, so, I mean, that's also part of the empowerment. Uh, yeah. So Zen. Um, okay, we've got more stuff coming in for metrics and goals again. How uh, do you set up the quantitative aspect of the goals for the metrics uh, from Palupi? She says that uh, she feels the numbers can be arbitrary and we don't always know if it's um, too big or small of a goal to attain. Uh, the trick is you don't set the numbers too high. Eh? You set too high, nobody can do like bye-bye, go home, I give up. You, you, you need to set it just nice, uh, just nice. So, so sometimes uh, when we learn that, okay, guys, uh, we learn that for this area, this is what we think is the right metric. Uh. It usually starts with, we think this is the right metric. We don't even, haven't even built the tracking for it. Go and build first. Uh. After we build, we see this is the current number, then okay, uh, how much can we move it? Uh, then, then we make Okay, I think there's a few things that we do as well is we don't, uh, like we say this is the metric to track. It doesn't mean we prescribe that this is the end goal. Uh, this is the number you need to move it towards. Uh, no, no, no. You should always move it to maximum, whatever you can do. So, so, uh, and we let the teams work it out. Uh, we learned that you put a, like, this is the goal point. Uh, it might not help uh, in the end of the day. We learned that, hey, you can only move it by 0, 0.00 something percent. Yeah, I hope that answers, yeah. Yeah, that works for me. Shah, you're a little deep in thought. Yeah. Um, I think, sorry, um, setting up the numbers, lots and lots of like debates. Like I can, I can just tell you that like I'm looking at something in the future and just to identify the metrics, I, we have gone through like seven rounds of like intense war room discussions with the data analytics team, the um, data scientist teams, the product teams that are all taking care of this. Um, uh, and at, but at the end of the day, like we all keep asking the same question. What are we trying to build? Who are we building it? And um, how do we know that what we're building is helping 
the person. Like it's always about like what are you building for and for what and how do you know that's being solved. Um, there are a lot of cases where we found that the metrics that we are trying to achieve is not existent, is non-existent, um, or it, it needs a lot more time to build. So then what we do next is we just go back and we're like, what's the closest, next best thing um, that we can use? Um, and I agree with Casey, like, don't go very ambitious because it's just going to demotivate everyone, especially when you're releasing something new. It's like, you're just going to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, try and get help on trying to figure out um, what is the potential market reach. You can obviously do some kind of like sizing exercise. Or you can do some kind of like forecasting exercise. Um, you can get your analysts, you can get someone. Um, but yeah, I mean, like if you're a product manager, you know half the time when you're communicating metrics, you are like, half, you, you have no idea what you're doing in the first weeks of the releases. You just hope and then slowly you start learning as it starts getting really stuck. Yeah, normally you're just uh, you're just trying to wing that, to be honest. Um, make it so you make it, right? That's the mantra. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> do you do any uh, competitive benchmarking? Like any, are there any references out there for something they're trying to implement usually? Yeah, we do. We, we try to um, use as many competitor analysis that we can to figure out, but obviously you can't always get the numbers that you want from the competitors, right? So um, it's always with a finger in the air kind of a thing when you're trying to benchmark yourself. <laughs> just like, see how lah. Um, okay, just wrapping up the questions before we move on to the quick lightning round. Uh, what are your favorite tools to use when it comes to um, either planning the metrics or also tracking them? You know, like some people use Firebase, but like, uh, what are your thoughts? Espresso machine, lots of coffees to stare at it. Um, jokes apart, but um, for metrics measuring, we um, currently use Tableau um, as a reporting dashboard. Of course, as SQL, if you have databases, you can run your own SQLs and scripts if you want. Yeah. Um, and well, um, like I said previously, I'm so glad that I have a data analyst, so he, did, he helps me manage whenever I don't have time for this. Noted. How about you, Casey? Sorry, what was the question again? Uh, tools, uh, is it? Problem. Yes, for metrics. Tools for metrics. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't review what we use, lah. But I mean, uh, we, okay. we use. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of very good analytics tool in the market, lah. So we we actually mm. use the very good ones, lah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your highly specific answer. <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. So <laughs> it's like this is what Petronas is like, I suppose. Tools only also cannot share. Um, all right. So Lisa, passing back to you. Uh, can you go ahead with the lightning round questions for our speakers? Lisa? Yep, sorry, struggling with mute button. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? Wow. I mean, even, even, 50? Yeah, even though, right, we've spent uh, more than a year in COVID and you, you still hear this every day. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I was talking on mute. You know, you hear it every other day, despite the fact that we've been using collaboration tools and working from home. <laughs> okay. It's true, every day. Mm. Time for the lightning round of questions. Okay, do we do we remember how this works, everyone? Okay, if 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 not, um, uh, each of you need to have a, a piece of paper that you can you can write on and uh, somewhat quite a very legible pen lah. Okay, like a sharpie for example, so that we can all see what it is that you raise. Um, and, and Casey will have to turn on his, his camera <laughs> for this segment of, of the questioning. Um, but it's okay. I don't think I think we will definitely be able to see your, your answers because you're supposed to show it instead of, uh, instead of say it. So when I ask a question, I'll give you about you know uh, five seconds to write down your, your answer and then I'll count down uh, and then we can uh, flash up 
the answers uh, to that question at the same time. And uh, depending on how different the answers are, we might have a follow-up question about how, how why, why it is that you answered the way that you, the way that you did. Okay. So first question is actually uh, a very easy one. Um, I, I hope it's easy. Uh, which one in your view is harder to measure? Product success or team success? Okay. So I'll give you like, five seconds to think about that and write it down. And then after that, I'll count down from three. Okay, we call this the lightning round for a reason. <laughs> it's supposed to be quick answers, okay. Please show your answers in three, two, one. Okay, Casey, are you, what, what was that? Team, team, team metrics are, are harder, harder to measure. Uh, maybe you could give us a quick explanation as to, as, as to why that is. Is it, is it because people are harder to measure than like technology? <laughs> Absolutely. La. Very hard to measure people. La. Chemistry, up, up, uh, so many factors. Yeah. So, so I mean uh, that, that mix and match to, to have the right team that, that gel together and run together is not easy. La. Uh, so, so as they say, form storm, I forgot what was the rest already. Hopefully start doing great work together. La. Yeah. Sure. I think, yeah, I mean, human psychology is like the hardest thing to figure out, right? Like, like one, two years ago before COVID, if long weekends, I'll be like super excited and like super engaged now it's long weekend and like just not my productivity just deeps because i'm like shit i can't travel anywhere right now um so team using you know humans always keep changing and your your teammates you yourself are changing every single time so trying to measure the team and trying to make sure that they're all succeeding is very rare mm, i agree i once did a psychology test that told me that I like objects more than people. So I totally agree with you on this. Much easier to measure product success compared to uh, team success. So, okay, on to our uh, next question. Okay, and, and this, I suppose, uh, we, we asked this indirectly already uh, during, during the panel, but it's okay. Uh, and, and this can serve as a key takeaway for, for our participants as well. What do you think are the top three product metrics that every product manager should use? Irrespective of you know what kind of feature it is or what kind of product it is, what what do you think are the top three that are the most relevant to to everyone in general? Give you a little bit more time to write this down because it's three, three items. Casey, don't forget to turn on your camera. <laughs> Okay. Very good, very good. Okay. Okay, let's show our answers in three, two, one. Let's reach adoption rate, satisfaction score. And is is that Casey with only one thing? What what does that say? What does that say? Prioritize. Prioritize. <laughs> <She luck. laughs> uh, prioritize. It's only one thing, yeah. That's that's your role, Casey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the like, metrics. Like, that's the whole the point. The role is to prioritize. It's, like, uh, it's what you do, the metrics. <laughs> that's why you brief, okay? Yeah, this is a good example of people ask A, you answer B, lah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Purposely, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Um, this is the uh okay third third question. Um. Which one do you think is harder? Uh, tracking the metrics themselves or convincing people to take action based on what the metrics are telling them? Convincing who? <laughs> oh, you said your answer out loud. Okay. <laughs> okay. Casey, Casey, you can say not your yet, answer not out loud. Yet. <laughs> Tracking, tracking the metrics of convincing people to take action based on what you see uh, 
that the metrics are telling you. Sorry, uh, uh, Lisa, already didn't pay attention. What, what, what was the question again? <laughs> Which one is harder, Casey? Tracking, measuring the metrics themselves or convincing people to take action based on the metrics? Uh, the, the latter is usually the tougher one. Uh, uh, <laughs> but having said that, uh, having said that, uh, having metrics is much more easier to drive alignment than having none. Uh. Uh, having none is my opinion versus yours. Having data is very clear. Lah. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. I mean, and that's why this talk is uh, very popular. One of our most popular, in fact, we had so many participants. Okay, last and final question. Totally nothing, nothing to do with uh, the topic at all, but an interesting one. Okay, so remember to write your answer on the piece of paper. Um, if you had a choice and if it was a dare, um, would you shave your head or shave your eyebrows? Which one? <laughs> shave your head or shave your eyebrows? So you'd have to walk around with either no hair or no eyebrows. Which one is it? Okay. Three, two, one. Head. Head. Okay. Brave soul. Eyebrows. <laughs> okay. La. That actually, I expected that answer. <laughs> what about you, Lisa? For me, yeah. Uh, I'd actually have to go with the head, you know, because uh, walking around with no eyebrows like kind of freaks me out. I think I would I would scare myself in the mirror every morning, but you know, with, without hair, still kind of quirky. You just need to invest in an eyebrow pencil. <laughs> that is true. I was thinking of wearing wearing a hat, but I don't know. I, drawing my eyebrows also freaks me out. <laughs> Okay, that, that, that is the end of the lightning round. Thank you for being so sporting and thank you for, for answering uh, my weird questions. Back to Kim for the wrap-up. Hey, you're supposed to take the wrap-up. Oh, uh, am I? Walao. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off the people like this. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so so as, as, as always, um, uh, thank you. Uh, to our speakers for giving their time and sharing uh, their their wisdom, uh, we 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 hope that you will be able to stay in touch with them on uh, with the contact details that we'll share in the uh, subsequent slide. Um, but before that, uh, we'd really like uh, your feedback on the session. Uh, it's a really short survey and uh, your input helps us to make these sessions more relevant, more interesting and uh, better for you. So please take some time to, to scan this and to fill up the survey. Uh, complain also can tell us like Lisa, this sucks, you know, <laughs> it's not interesting, you know, or please like wear a nicer t-shirt, Wh whatever it is, you know, we take your feedback. Okay. So please scan this uh, and give us your feedback. I've also dropped the URL in the chat if people want to click and answer that right away. For the speakers, uh, could you do a bit of a self-promo and drop your LinkedIn URL in the chat as well for people to connect with you? Also, uh, FYI, for anyone who can see the screen, the addresses are also there. So you can go uh, stalk, I mean, message them after the event for any questions, um, burning questions that are unanswered. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Okay, and um, besides our speakers, you can stay updated with what it is women who code are doing as well. We have many chapters, actually. I mean, it's an international organization, so um, we have chapters all around the world. But specifically, we have a social media presence uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn for the Kuala Lumpur chapter. And we have not just product management talks, but we have software engineering talks and data related talks, cybersecurity talks as well. And Brianna is like leading all of them. So, you know, Brianna is the person to talk to <laughs> if you want to know more about any of these other uh, topics that we host and organize sessions for. And uh, yeah, so we're on all these platforms like Facebook, Meetup, Pitik, LinkedIn. So take your pick. Okay, and for everyone who's uh, who's still here, please indulge us so that we can take a quick group uh, picture together. Uh, so in order to do that, please turn on your camera and then we will take a... 
Is it still a selfie group, group wifi? Is that what the kids are calling it these days? <laughs> You're a kid yourself. Or maybe we should, you, we should ask Jia Ying. <laughs> there, are people, there are people under 30 in this chat, okay? <laughs> Alright, I think we can unspotlight our speakers. Wow, can you see the picture that big? 